two quarters. Um, 33% were negative for all parameters, which means they are clear. Not much um, contamination of the sand. We're talking again about Portugal, which part of is very much related to California in terms of climate at the beach. Um, yeast and dermatophytes tend to increase along the sampling periods. I defy anyone in this room to tell me why. Anybody have any idea? Organic Dermatophytes. Organic matter. Organic matter and people. Yeah. Simple as that. Throughout the summer, people go to the beach and they leave behind organic matter and they will contaminate the sand with whatever they're carrying with them. So this is what we could check that throughout the summer, we actually get an increase in the amount of yeasts and dermatophytes on the beach sand. Of course, we found interesting relationships because we were looking into different species and groups of species. But uh, let's just say that this is for mycology people, not for you. It's uh, a little bit too much, I think. Um, so basically, during these five years, we published the results in, in a paper. Uh, you had access to it, yeah. I believe, yeah. And we came up with new values. Now, why, we would do, well, why would, did we do that? One simple reason. The previous uh, values that we used to propose as limits were based on results from the whole country, but less beaches, at a period when people were not aware of what they needed to do. What was accomplished with this five-year monitoring program is that the amount of microorganisms in, in sand reduced tremendously. So do we carry on using the same levels as indicator? Uh, do we want to say 60 yeast colony farming units per gram of sand is still okay? Or do we realize that by now we've cleaned up so much that we should reduce the limit that we consider from here onwards, you should take care of the beach. There is something wrong. So this was our revision. But there's a catch here. Each country or each region will have their own levels and specific indicators. You should not think, that's fine, let's use that. And I'll try and use that in the northern US. All the beaches will be extremely contaminated according to our standards. You can't compare them. Maybe somewhere in California you can use this, but not in the north of the US. So regionally, those limits have to be found by people working with uh, samples of that area. You have to find your own limits. You have to find what is normal. What do you consider as average in your country, in your area? And that's what you have to use as a reference which is, like you, what you were saying, you have to do also with water quality. You can't have one uh, act controlling the whole country when you have tropical areas and cold areas and Alaska and Hawaii. It's not possible. They will behave differently. This is just to give you a visual response of, or idea of what happened during those five years. This was the beginning, 2006. I told you about the increase in yeasts and in um, dermatophytes. Well, there it is. Basically, this is first sample of the season, baiting season, which is before the baiting season actually starts. I always made sure that we made one sampling before people started going to the beach to have as a reference for the contamination itself afterwards. And this is throughout the summer. This is what happened. So the amount of beaches that exceed the levels that we considered as the normal ones increases throughout the summer. And this is what happens in 2010, at the end of the monitoring program. Somebody could say, from now on, there is no need to continue in this monitoring program because as long as people want, they know that the beach is sticking to good quality. So unless there is an outbreak of whatever, they know exactly what to do now to maintain a good quality of microorganisms on the sand. So notice that the first time, this is before 
the bathing season, therefore there is no cleaning up, the bars are not open yet, people go walking in the beaches with the dogs and uh, leaving everything behind. The algae that come from the sea and the, the, the seagulls and whatever, they will leave just about everything in the sand. And what we have is a much higher percentage of beaches that exceed the levels that we consider normal that disappear throughout the summer. And even funny enough, it seems like 18 and 15 percent, they are very close. It's like a baseline. So we've reached the minimum contamination of the beaches throughout the country. Obviously, these include some beaches which do not have good quality standards, and that's the reason why there is an exceeding of 18 and 15 percent of samples. Because not all the sands that we analyzed belong to beaches that were considered as good quality. Sometimes municipalities want to turn a beach into something usable and they give to us sand to be analyzed. They provide water as well to the regulating agency, regulatory agency, and they basically want to use that as area as a beach. And for that reason, obviously, they have to uh, do it. So this just to say that those 15 and 18 and 15 percent doesn't mean that there's no possibility of going down. It means that 15 or 18 percent of the beaches that we were using during this research program probably were not of good quality and stayed that way until the end. Okay? And then we found out overall recommendations that we could use. This is a specific, uh, a completely different um, topic. During the work that we did, the monitoring program, we came up with this. Garbage removal meaning let's take away the trash from the beach as often as possible, let's have enough bins to collect all the trash, let's treat the sand when there is a problem, and uh, I heard that you had a problem in California to which, for which you use chlorine, well we use iodine, one of our municipalities uses iodine, sprays the sand every summer, and checks for the contamination level before and after to see and it usually comes down to completely to clean zero sterile sand is it a good idea i wouldn't know i would not advise it's not my business to be honest my business is how do we check the result of the work that they are doing um, and that's what i was worried with but it does exist and if you have a problem with the sand you can treat it and that's basically the message that's outlined here surroundings you have to including the new bathing water directive that we have, which is the equivalent to your Recreational Water Act. In Europe, now, the new bathing water directive that came out recently doesn't just check the, the, the water itself, but the surrounding as one of the possible contaminants of the water quality. So we don't just look at the water, we look at what's going around the water. And we absolutely find this important in sand, especially for uh, fungus, fungi. And then we know the factors that negatively influence the quality of beach sand. Overuse of the beach, obvious reasons, admission of pets, accumulation of trash, abandonment of remains from fishing, which doesn't really happen that much anymore, and rodents and prowling animals that come down at night and they will uh, use whatever is organic matter left on the beach. So we use this to build up a leaflet, which we distributed to the public. So people would go to the beach and would have this at their disposal at the bar, for example, to take, read, whatever, do what you want. So inside, we put exactly, visually speaking, tell people what should happen and what should not happen at the beach in order to protect the, to no. at the sand, leave only your footprint. Oh. Basically, it's do not yeah. leave anything behind yeah. if you want to protect the quality. Then it's the positive influencing factors and the negative influencing factors, which is basically this that I showed just before. I think this made a hell of a difference, to be honest, because that's from, from this on we, we, we saw that there was a, a, ch a change, because people obviously don't want to be lying down on sand that is contaminated by all kinds of microorganisms, so they will help. They are willing to do that. It's up to the regulatory agencies to regulate. So, just to give you a timeline, uh, basically I'm finishing off, but I want to tell you that um, in September 2011, there was a 
a workshop in Michigan City, in Michigan City, which gathered a few people that worked in sand and water quality, or that were absolutely interested in sand quality. And um, I was invited as being one of the people. What we did was to produce a revision paper, a review paper, from everything that was published on sand quality since the beginning that we could find, including your own. Um, this has been submitted. It's not out yet, but it would come out this, this year probably. But it's a very good paper and it talks about all kinds of topics related to what kinds of microorganisms and the water and the sand and the interaction between those two. Frankly, it goes a little bit beyond my expertise, but still, it's a very good paper. It's going to come out. But it didn't end there. I also mentioned the price and the speed. I believe I didn't mention the speed yet, but the analysis of fungus, the uh, dermatophytes take about one month to give a result because they are very slow growers. So how can we speed it up? Because frankly, people give us a sand sample to analyze and one month later we give the result. What's the point? People have already been to the beach, God knows how many times. We have this problem with water quality. Uh, people want real-time analysis on water quality because when you have a bloom of, of bacteria in the water, it's already too late. People have already been bathing and they're trying to speed it up as much as possible. So what can we do with the sand? Uh, one month later is too late. So we're trying to use molecular biology, but we have to put it on hold because of financial situation, obviously, but it's going on. Uh, slowly but surely we'll get there. Um, in 2012, there was a workshop. Um, I've been organizing uh, every year a workshop trying to get laboratories to work together to produce analysis, um, to compare results, to see if everybody's working okay, if they're doing okay, what's the average that we all get as a group, um, are we compatible, are we looking into the same things the same way. This was the point, but together with that I always had discussion on the sand and water and environmental exposure subject. And in 2012 I decided to have a room with no more than maybe twice as much as I have here in this room today, people, and of all kinds of expertise. And I divided the group in two. I didn't worry about viruses, I didn't worry about um, parasites, but I did worry about bacteria fungi, and I asked half of the room to figure out what should we do, what should we look into, and when and why, in both of these areas, in fungi and in bacteria. And this gave rise to a paper which is coming out, uh, already came out actually, and that I was coming to present here at the OSM meeting this year, uh, which is not a revision paper, review paper, but a recommendation paper, which tells you, you should look at this because of that, etc., blah, 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 bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites in the end. We wrote everything. We involved three people from the US in this paper, and it was a quite, it's quite a good one. Um, it's not very deep, it's not exactly for high-end uh, scientists, but anybody can understand it, I suppose. Um, there, will, there will be, of course, microorganisms names, but you, you have to. And um, in 2013, I launched the Interlab network uh, and the early meetings, as I was just talking about. But there is one thing. In this, uh, this year, we have a meeting in Lisbon an international water meeting, but I'll come back to that. So this just to say that this, this meeting that I've been organizing every year is going to change, this year in particular. So what do we have at the moment? We as National Institute of Health are providing the service to the community. We're doing research in order to implement the molecular detection, which would give us fast results, especially for dermatophytes. I couldn't care less if I have 20 or 40 colony farming units. I prefer to be able to say, this sand is contaminated with dermatophytes and that's it, or not. Extension of the analysis to specific fungal and bacterial pathogens. Why? Because after this workshop in 2012, what we produced was actually um, something that tell us, tells us that we're not looking at all that we should be looking at. Maybe the fecal indicator bacteria are just not enough. We have to look at bacteria that specifically reside in the sand and not in the water. <coughs> like the Staphylococcus aureus, the staph infection causing agent, which we don't find in water all that often. Anyway, um, networking with other research groups around the world, absolutely, we need to get our act together. That was my point. And at a certain point, I find myself organizing this year's um, 
seminar or whatever you want to call it, a uh, workshop, very close to the International Water Association meeting, okay, which is going to take place in Lisbon. And I thought, well, why not make use of some of the people that are coming down for that meeting, get everybody together uh, that is interested in this subject on our own meeting the day before. Because they're already in Portugal anyway. And instead of just Portuguese people discussing what should we do about what where, then we can have some external participation in the in, in debate. And in the end, this started growing, snowballing, and we now have a, a congress taking place in September. Uh, international. It's called uh, Trends for um, Environmental Micro Microbiology and Public Health. And it's just not even only about water and sand. It goes also about environmental exposure, as in air quality and food contamination, uh, what you ingest, of course, and the resistance of the, uh, pa the, the, the pathogenic uh, microorganisms against uh, um, anti antibacterials and antifungals and whatever. <coughs> this is the website, basically, of the meeting. And somehow, <laughs> I think, how many are we now? About, I don't know, wait, yeah. All these people decided to meet in Lisbon, and apparently there are more coming in, uh, with experience in sand, most of them from the US and, and Europe. And in the end, we've decided, since we're all getting together, it's time to write something down. It was actually just a thought. I mean, it's Europe and the United States getting together for the first time to discuss bacteria and fungi and parasites and viruses in sand and in water and hold on. Isn't it the right time to just produce something to send to the regulatory agencies to tell the World Health Organization, wake up? So these people started getting together, organizing, and at this moment, these are the people involved in what is going to be a um, scientific paper, if you want, because we want to publish it in a journal, just to make sure it will be available in the future for whomever goes looking for it easily. But the point is to produce something which is like an opinion, an open letter made by scientists to tell people, wake up, it's time to regulate this, not just the water, okay? So now let's go back, because I just want you to, to see that this was the website of the meeting, so um, I know there will be somebody here from Hawaii coming to this meeting, because it's really um, involving too many people not to have as much participation as possible, and Hawaii does have one thing, you couldn't care less, and you started using uh, Clostridium as one of the indicators for water quality. Um, and you're the only one doing that, and it's a very wise, it was a very wise choice. And I think you have a chance to actually be one of the first people to take care of this sand-wise. You have the possibility to do that if you choose to do so. I mean, we don't have it regulated because we are depending on the uh, European Union um, to produce uh, directives. But in the U.S., you work also at a local basis, regional basis. So you can do it if you want. So, what else is out there? Very simple. From Europe that I could find up till now, there, has, there is data from the UK on the coast, from Italy, Austria, the Canary Islands, continental Spain, because there is also the continental part and just islands in Spain, uh, Assoge from Portugal, Madeira from Portugal, and then there is Greece. One island was completely screened, all of the sand throughout uh, the whole coast of the, the, the island was looked into, and France, but that's very, very old data. It's all based on fungi, as far as I know, and it's from the southern coast. And then from the U.S., there is tremendous amount of data because the U.S. had one idea. The sand contaminates the water, so let's look at the bacteria to make sure that we are not um, overlooking one of the sources of pollution of the water that we want to use for recreational purposes. Yes, but there are other things besides the bacteria. So that's when I came here for the first time. We started debating, and that's why since then I have never stopped coming back to the United States, because apparently I brought in something that was not very um, looked into over here. But you have tremendous amount of data only on bacteria, but a lot of it. And also over here, you've started this work 
Hawaii started this work. And uh, there is, from Miami, one paper that I could find from one of the people that are working with us at the moment, which is Elena uh, Solo Gabriel. And she produced a paper with uh, her group, which also looks into yeasts and parasites at the sand. And of course, they exist, we know that. But it's not just the bacterial part. From the rest of the world, I could find information from Algeria. There was one, peop one person contact contacting me very soon, uh, asking for advice on, uh, on, on, on some work that she was doing for research, for a PhD, um, because she, she is analyzing sand and wanted uh, some my input on her ideas. Uh, so I know they're working on this basically because of this. I found uh, some data from Morocco, very old as well, uh, from Iran. There is from Brazil, who's joining us at the 10th meeting in Lisbon, from Sao Paulo, and from Malaysia. So there is data scattered throughout the world, but there is not a lot of it. The people that actually have the most work done so far is in Europe, especially Portugal and in the US, especially the northern area in Hawaii. So again, I think it's time to implement and regulate. And I think it's time that uh, your participation in this is, of course, extremely important. Because I remember the days when people would say, water analysis, why? <laughs> so the white letter members, as I mentioned, uh, just want to give you a comparison between uh, something that you're familiar with and what I mean by Algarve. So this is uh, what our beaches look like in the south of the country. And uh, halfway through the country they look like the, pre the, the first one that I showed you with a lot of people and absolutely nothing besides sand. This is all I have to give you. Thank you. I think for questions. Given the uh, extreme difficulty and lengthiness uh, and length of time needed to analyze for some of the microorganisms mm -hmm. you're discussing, what, uh, how would you uh, approach regulation in this case? On what basis would you base your regulations, your bacterial? I think one thing does not stop the other. Um, currently, if you want to know what we do is because we can produce results after one week, but not the complete results. We always provide the partial results, missing only one parameter, like two weeks later maximum, but usually about one week and a half later, so that they can work with it. And the last parameter, unfortunately, we can't do anything about. Uh, but that's only one th month later that we can produce the final report on one specific analysis. So we produce partial things. If you ask me in terms of regulatory situations, I don't think it's, um, it's necessary to think that way, to be honest, because if you want to regulate, you want to worry about how, why, and when. That's it. You just basically say, sand should be analyzed, and it should be analyzed this amount of times per year, how much the sample should be, and why should you do it, if you want to explain why, because that's the way we build our laws in Portugal, at least in Europe. We always have a little tiny bit explaining why. Um, and you decide that the limits are, and that's it. And the timeline will be obviously something that covers everything. So, so what if you, buy you can have two different situations, like you have to provide a partial report within two weeks and the final report within one and a half months. Mm -hmm. It's a possibility. And if a beach fails and has bad high levels? Then they have to do something about it, like what we do with the water. I mean, we close down and we check what's going on. We let it clean up, and it, with the beach sand, we can just basically use iodine and treat it. So it is possible. There's something that can be done about it. How about the blue flag does not include sand at the moment? No. They tried, but the, f the, uh, the mother organization, the Federation for uh, Environmental Education, a lot of countries in it, and each country has its own priorities. And basically, though Portugal was fighting for it for a long time, what happened was we were the only ones having data on this. So the federation itself was like, okay, why do we care about this if the World Health Organization doesn't? Yeah. It's, it's been circling about. It's like the World Health Organization doesn't 
can't be bothered because nobody is, because there are no epi studies. Uh, epi studies don't happen because there is no financing for it. And then uh, we have to, it just goes on and on and on. And it's really, we have to do something about this. And that's what struck me when I started organizing this thing in Lisbon. It suddenly everybody wants to join in and produce something that will be used to send out to regulatory agencies. Now, why is this? Because everybody feels the same way. It's time to act. How can we do this? And this opened up a window of opportunity. Why don't we do it? And that's what we're deciding to do this year, basically. Yeah. I don't know. In, in the first study that you discussed, uh, where you were looking at the three classes of beaches, uh, mm -hmm. of beaches, you showed us the relative distribution of the of the yeah. uh, uh, in the sand, the dry sand, the wet sand, and the water. Yes. But I might have missed it. Uh, did you see differences in total in I did. absolute numbers between the different classes? I did. I didn't tell you. It's not stated there. Basically, the worst beaches that you can possibly think of are the wild ones. Huh. But now we know why. Because there is no cleaning up. There is all kinds of organic matter at the beach. And there is fauna. There's flora. So they will basically bring up the amount of contaminants. Not necessarily bad ones, but they exist. They, they, they are detected. So those are the worst ones. <laughs> and obviously, as expected, excuse me, I'm not promoting the blue flag system, but the ones with the blue flag were the best ones. For obvious reasons, because they have enough, they collect the garbage, they clean up, they have facilities, toilets, etc. So they were, of course, the best ones. Who pays for that? I mean, here in Hawaii, even though our economy is completely reliant on tourism, a lot of our beaches are pretty pretty dirty. It's pretty much voluntary if you throw your garbage out or not, you know. Yeah. How in Portugal, given your economic woes? With us, it's voluntary as well, whether you take your garbage or not. People are just, please take it with you. But at the end of the day, somebody cleans up. That's a way of doing it. And that is regulated. Somebody, somebody is paid to. to yeah. Okay. It's worth it in the end. So that it seems like you were talking about mm -hmm. that, that you got more followers in the wet sand than the dry sand. So 28 in country or something? It's, uh, no, the dry sand has more. Yeah, in fact, what we found in the wet sand, and that's the reason why we're not analyzing it anymore, is that the wet sand is like a mixture between dry sand and water. So what you have in both is what you find for fungus, for fungi, in the wet sand. So why bother? You know, if you've got the data from the water and from the dry sand, it's enough. So you get more in dry sand? Mm hmm You get more in dry sand? Mm hmm The sun? Way more. I can go back if you want. Ow. The water is, it washes the sand away because it's current. So, okay, it was a vacuum water. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So, 74, 73, 67%. So, it's stable. Most of the fungi that we analyzed are on the dry sand, period. Yeah. This is the sea water. So uh, this is just a fungal abundance, of course. If we look at the bacteria, it's exactly the opposite, because the bacteria tend to be more in the water. They need the moist. Yeah? <laughs> OK. Anything else? So regarding the organic okay, matter in your sand, uh, I believe when when source might be the people who bring food and or leftovers like yes. crafting it on the yes, and uh, could there be other sources like the water itself can carry uh, for example a bad weight? A lot. It happens uh, very frequently. And yeah. And so do you see a lot of uh, I'm not familiar with the beaches in Portugal. Uh, do you see a lot of like uh, aquatic vegetation growth in the water in summer? No, what, what we have is, um, especially in the, the west coast, uh, what we have is, it's the Atlantic coast. Uh, it's, it's not like what you have, although here it's the Pacific, for some reason it's called the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's not very Pacific at all in the Atlantic coast. The waves can be very hard, and you know, uh, probably uh, you've seen uh, pictures and heard about uh, beaches in Azadeh because of surfing lately. They produce very, very high waves. 
in Nazare. Uh, what happens is there is material brought from the water uh, whenever we have those periods with very high and strong waves they will bring things into the sand. Uh, also from remains from fishing and whatever but there are two area two periods throughout the year one is at the end of August uh, we, we call it the, the, the yeah Marej Vivas basically it's a period when the tides are extremely aggressive and they just invade the whole beach and they bring just about everything with it and then a lot of algae come along but we don't have any vegetation growing on the beach itself we have just outside the beach or in the dunes already but not where people lie down so there is no cross-contamination on that account, no. but there is coming from water, absolutely, no doubt. One last question before. Yeah. So, so you proposed uh, values for E. coli in the coastline. There are some samples based on the sandy beach data. I lost you. Sorry. Yeah. You. You proposed values for Ecola and Ecola. Yeah. Yes, but uh, you mean this? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, we. This is the proposal we had, but to be honest, this is not really very good. That's the outcome of the workshop in 2012. It's very good to compare the results of what we have, contamination of water, etc., blah, 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 but we are missing parameters here. We're just looking into bacteria that are used, which was a decision we made in the beginning. In the beginning, we were thinking, what shall we use as indicators for the, water, for the sand quality? And we thought, on the bacterial part, the decision was made to think, OK, the same bacteria, because they are supposed to be indicators of human problems both in water, so why not sand? What happens is a few groups of bacteria were overlooked. The bacteria that do not hang around in the water, but they hang around in our skin and in uh, other animals. So that's why I say this needs to be reviewed at the moment. Okay, so we're learning. We're moving on. Go on. So this 25 like, like from the E. coli, is yeah. per yeah. that means uh, how, how, how did you derive this uh, numbers from the... This is average. Average. Yeah. So of all the data we collected. Okay. If E. coli counts, for example, exceeds the Then we warn the, the beach or the municipality that asks us to analyze the beach sand that the perimeter is higher than it's supposed to be, or higher than normal. We warn them. No raising red flags or be careful. No, no, just we just warn them. It's higher than the average. Then they do whatever they want with it. And we have no data no. This there is, but we don't have any it's in Portugal. It's not based on, on a, a, uh, any kind of epidemiological no, analysis. No, no, no. Based on averages being higher or lower. Yes, exactly. There is no known health uh, expression on these results, or on these uh, proposed. Can you perform, for example, like, uh, risk assessment? It has been done. In 2011, it worked. It, it, already, it really was done. It's already been published. Just not by ourselves. That's why I don't understand why WHO is not doing anything yet. <laughs> yeah? OK, let's give John. Thank you. Thank you.